Hello and welcome to lecture 50 of my class from Data to Decisions. I'm Chris Mack and this is a lecture on detecting multicollinearity. Uh, obviously we're continuing to discuss regressions, multiple regressions in particular, and the question comes up, uh, what, are, what happens when you have multicollinearity? Discussed a number of problems already. Uh, if we're building a model, we might be adding, deleting predictor variables, deciding whether or not these variables belong in our model. And if we have severe multicollinearity, then adding or deleting a predictor variable will dramatically change the regression, regression coefficients of the other variables. Also, uh, the standard errors of the regression coefficients become very large, maybe even encompassing zero. Uh, it's possible that you'll have a model that is significant. It passes the F-test. obviously fitting the data. You can see that just by looking at it. At the same time, every individual regression coefficient will be labeled as in, not statistically significant because its confidence intervals include zero. And finally, you might notice that some regression coefficients are different than what you'd expect. Maybe you have some idea that a uh, certain coefficient should be positive, and then when you actually do the regression, you find it's negative. Or add or delete predictive variables, the sign of uh, one of the remaining regression uh, variables, coefficients, uh, flips. It goes from positive to negative. None of this really makes any sense. This is what happens when you have multicollinearity. I want to emphasize, as I've said before, this is a problem with interpreting the meaning of the coefficients. It's not necessarily a problem if the only thing you think, the only thing that's important to you is making predictions with this model because it's going to fit the data and, and allow predictions uh, just as easily with multicollinearity as without, uh, as long as the collinearity remains constant. Uh, doesn't change over time or from one data set to the next. That's very much a function of the scope of your model, but uh, if you want to use the model to interpret what's going on, get cause and effect, uh, understand the meaning of your coefficients as, as having some physical meaning, uh, multicollinearity can destroy all of that. So we often want to detect it, and then in the future lectures, I'll also talk about how to mitigate it, how to address the problem of multicollinearity. This lecture, we're going to talk just about detecting it. And um, before I do that, let me talk about some of the causes. We're going to get back to the causes in the next lecture when we start figuring out how to deal with multicollinearity because how we deal with it is some, somewhat affected by the cause. One is sampling. The only sample regions of, of space where everything is correlated, well, then our model is going to end up being correlated as well. Um, we might be able to fix this by changing the sampling. It could be, though, that sampling doesn't have anything to do with it. Maybe that what's really happening in the world is our predictors are correlated. Right? If the population or, or our model require, demand, that the predictors are correlated because that's just the way it is, well, then that's just the way it is. You have to deal with it. Uh, it also could be that we don't have a good model um, maybe the scope of the model isn't wide enough to break the correlation. If you have a very narrow range of x, then x and x squared might be highly correlated, and, and you might not be able to see the difference. Whereas if you look at your model over a wider range of x, you might be able to detect a difference between x and x squared. Here's an example. Um, I've got this, this data. We've looked at it several times from the body fat uh, experimental data set. I have a correlation between abdomen circumference and chest circumference. Well, this makes perfect sense when you think about it. You know, somebody who's larger is usually larger both in the chest and the abdomen. Um, but could it be that we don't have data in these other regions simply because none of our subjects happened to, to fall into those regions of space? Um, maybe there are people who have... Um, small chest circumference and larger abdomen circumference, or larger chest circumference and smaller abdomen circumference. Uh, you can imagine body shapes where people actually are in these regions. And it could be that our sampling just didn't happen to include any people like that. Those people would help us break the multicollinearity 
caused by our sampling. If that's the case, then the multicollinearity is not inherent in the model and not inherent in the population. Uh, alternately, it could be that there are no people in these regions whatsoever and that the, the, co the collinearity between these two variables is real and uh, we can't get out of it by changing our sampling. That's just an example. We're going to come back uh, to this type of example when we start talking about addressing multicollinearity. All right, let's talk about how to detect it. Our first method of detecting we've already talked about. It's the correlation matrix. We look at how every variable correlates with every other variable. But these are all pairwise coefficients of correlation. Uh, X1 versus X2, X1 versus X3, X2 versus X3, etc. But there can be more complicated relationships. Uh, X1 could be highly correlated with the sum of X2 and X3, for example, but not either variable separately. This kind of thing happens. Uh, therefore, the correlation matrix is somewhat limited in, in what it can tell you. I'm going to talk next about the variance inflation factor, which allows us to detect more complicated correlations, not just pairwise. And finally, we'll also mention eigensystem analysis. And this is going to prove important when we go to one of the most powerful ways of addressing multicollinearity, which is principal component analysis, or PCA, subject of a future lecture. All right, what is this variance inflation factor? This is um, a measure of how much the kth model coefficient is inflated beyond what it would be otherwise. Um, because the kth variable is correlated with all the other variables in the model. So what we do is we, cat, we regress the kth variable, x sub k, against all the other predictor variables. We think of kth predictor variable as a response. And then we use all the other predictor variables as the inputs, the regressors, and we do a, a linear regression, straight line regression. We ask, what is R squared for that model? Um, this coefficient of determination then is a measure of how much all the other parameters in the model allow me to predict what the kth predictor variable will be. If R squared is equal to 1, that means all of the information in the kth predictor variable x sub k, can be obtained, predicted, by the other regression variables. It's redundant. It adds no new information. Uh, that would be r squared equal to 1. And uh, the opposite, uh, the kth predictor variable is completely independent of all the others. That would be r squared equal to 0. All right. Let's look at that in more detail. When r squared is 0, no correlation. Uh, the kth predictor variable is not a function whatsoever of all the others. The variance inflation factor is 1. There's no inflation. If we let r squared of k go to 1, uh, what that is telling us is that, as I said, I can predict the kth predictor variable perfectly, given the information about all the other variables. In that case, variation inflation factor goes to infinity, and this kth regressor adds no new information. In between, this uh, variance inflation factor describes how much the variance grows. The variance of the coefficient of the kth predictor variable. The larger the VIF, the more severe the multicollinearity. We use a rule of thumb of about 4 or 5 for the variance inflation factor. If the variance inflation factor is 4, that means the standard error, the square root of the variance, uh, the standard error has doubled compared to what it would be if there had been no multicollinearity. So a doubling of the standard error somehow seems you know, reasonably significant. So we look for variance inflation factors that are on the order of 4 or larger. If they get really large, rule of thumb says if the variance inflation factor is 10 or more, then we might not be able to ignore it. We might actually have to act, uh, go through some strategy of mitigating the impact of multicollinearity.
Of course, this depends on what we're going to use the model for, as I've said multiple times. If we're only using the model to make predictions, then we'd be okay with uh, variance inflation. We can be okay with, with multicollinearity. But if we want to interpret the meaning of the coefficients and we have variance inflation factors of 10 or more, chances are we need to do something to mitigate this multicollinearity. Um, the other thing we can do is look at all these variable uh, uh, variance inflation factors and find the mean value, the average of all of them. And if the average of them starts getting large, you know, much bigger than one, uh, we worry as well. And we might think about whether or not our model is useful in terms of interpreting these coefficients without somehow mitigating uh, this multicollinearity. The other approach that we're going to take to for addressing multicollinearity will involve eigensystem analysis. So we're going to start by using eigensystem analysis to detect multicollinearity, then we'll move on to using it to address it in a, in a future lecture, as I've mentioned, called uh, PCA principal component analysis. So what is this eigensystem analysis? Well, maybe I have taken classes where you've done calculated eigenvalues before. If not, I'm not going to try to dive into the mathematics other than to kind of explain what it is very basically. So if I have a P by P matrix A, I'm going to subtract off a constant. Now, the way you subtract off a constant in, um, in matrices is to use the identity matrix. Remember, the identity matrix is zero everywhere except for along the diagonal of the matrix, and then it has a value of one. So if I do lambda, a, a scalar number lambda times i, that means lambda is everywhere along the diagonals. Uh, all this means is I'm taking my matrix and subtracting the number lambda off of every diagonal element, all the elements, all the other elements are constant or fixed at what they were. Then I'm going to take the determinant of that entire matrix. I'll set it equal to zero. That will result in P equations. And uh, equation with P roots, rather. Um, P is the number, the size of the matrix, 4 by 4, 5 by 5, 6 by 6, etc. They're going to be P roots to this equation. Those roots uh, will be the values of lambda that um, allow this determinant to be equal to zero. And we call those values of lambda eigenvalues. All right, that's a general idea of what an eigenvalue is. Uh, what we're going to do specifically is find the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix. Uh, we talked about in a previous lecture, if we standardized our variables with the, the correlation transformation, then we took the uh, transpose, multiplied by the, that vector again, that, that uh, matrix again, we get what's called the correlation matrix. Um, if we find the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix, we have these uh, P values, these P eigenvalues. And we look at their magnitudes. Are all of the magnitudes about the same? If all of the magnitudes of the eigenvalues are of similar magnitude, then we have no problem with multicollinearity. So one way of detecting multicollinearity and trying to uh, ask whether it's a big problem or not, is to find the maximum ratio of eigenvalues. So if I've, I look at for the maximum value of lambda and the minimum value of lambda, uh, that ratio is called the condition number of the correlation matrix. Uh, so we give the symbol kappa to represent this ratio of the biggest to the smallest eigenvalue of the correlation matrix. Uh, some people use the square root of those. So just notice if you if you go and look at other people's textbooks or literature, uh, they might be using the square root. I'm going to use the version that doesn't have the square root. Then if if all of these eigenvalues are about the same magnitude, then kappa is you know getting is pretty close to one, uh, not much bigger than one. But if there's a wide range of eigenvalues, then kappa becomes larger. 
if kappa is bigger than about 100, right, just a simple rule of thumb, if kappa is bigger than about 100, then we say we have a problem with multicollinearity. So this is just a way of overall detecting. Now, of course, if, if you use the square root uh, version of kappa, then you have to change this criterion to be 10 instead of. Sometimes I see people say, you know, 200. Some people I, square root say 15, for example. Um, so uh, there, there's no obvious um, cutoff, but I'm going to go with the 100 number. And if, if kappa in this definition is bigger than about 100, then we say, yes, we have an issue with multicollinearity that should be addressed. Here's an example of eigensystem analysis if I only have two regressors in my model. The reason I do this one is I can, I can calculate the eigenvalues analytically uh, in a fairly simple equation. Uh, as soon as you get to three, then the analytical equations for the eigenvalues are much more complicated. Uh, but with, with only two regressors, then things get very simple because all the correlation is governed by one number, R12. The first variable correlated with the second variable, first predictor variable and second predictor variable. Uh, so, um, you see what I'm doing? I'm subtracting off lambda from the diagonal elements of the correlation matrix. Uh, then I take the determinant, which is, I do a kind of a, this diagonal times this diagonal minus this off diagonal times this off diagonal. Uh, that's the determinant for a two by two, very easy. I set it equal to zero, find the roots, and here's the max root and the min root are shown, and there's my kappa. All right, if kappa needs to be less than 100, that's about the same thing as saying R12 needs to be less than about 0.98. And that's a fairly high correlation, right, 0.98. Uh, if, if, if your correlation is less than 0.98, well, then you can deal with that level of correlation uh, and probably not have to worry too much. But if the correlation between those two variables is more than 0.98, that's kind of the cutoff where we say, oops, we got a problem we have to deal with. As I've said, we're going to use this eigensystem analysis when we deal with multicollinearity in a future lecture. All right, what have we learned in lecture 50? As always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, please go back and review the material. What are the advantages and the disadvantages using the correlation ma matrix for detecting multicollinearity. How do the variance inflation factors address the main disadvantage of using the correlation matrix? And finally, how do we use the eigenvalues and the condition number to detect multicollinearity? That's this lecture. Next time, we'll talk about some strategies for addressing multicollinearity once we've detected it. Till then.